Hi guys, it's Andy McDonald, physio and strength and conditioning coach, and welcome to the Informed Performance Podcast. On today's show, I will be speaking to Daniel Bodkin, an athletic trainer and physical therapist who is the director of education for CSMI, the maker of the HUMAC Norm Isokinetic System, and he is the owner of Proactive Athletic Performance in Atlanta, Georgia. He is also an associated member of faculty for Untandem PT. This conversation with Daniel will focus purely on how rehab professionals can comprehensively use isokinetic systems. For those familiar with them already, you may learn some updated features and ways of using them that you didn't know how. And for people first learning about them, this episode provides a lot of jam-packed information on how and why you should use isokinetic systems during rehabilitation. Today's episode of the Informed Performance Podcast has been sponsored by Vald Performance, makers of the Nord Board. The Nord Board has become the gold standard for assessing field-based hamstring strength. By combining advanced sensors, real-time data visualizations, and cloud analytics, the Nord Board helps practitioners to accurately measure, monitor, and train individuals' hamstring strength or imbalances. To learn more about the Nord Board, visit our sponsor, VolPerformance.com. Informed Performance is proudly partners with Humac Norm by CSMI. If you or your organization has a Biodex or Cybex, then is your old software or computer slowing you down? If yes, then check out the Humac software or computer upgrade for Biodex systems 2, 3, and 4, and also the Humac Norm. Since 1982, over 3,000 Cybex and Biodex owners have rejuvenated the isokinetic machine they already own with the Humac system by CSMI. To learn more about the Humac upgrade, then head to humacnorm.com and select products and upgrades. You're listening to the Informed Performance Podcast with me, Annie McDonald, and here is today's guest, Daniel Bodkin. Daniel, welcome to the show, mate. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Hey, how are we doing? What I want to do today is, um, you know, focus our conversation all around isokinetics, to which, you know, you know a lot about. But just to kind of bring us up to speed, could you sort of outline your professional background and kind of, I guess, give us context of where you started and how you got into isokinetics? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually started out in the, uh, went going to the U.S. Army and my job there was actually shooting rockets out of tanks. And after a couple tours uh, around the planet, I decided I needed to get out and try the whole college thing. Um, I've always really been big into exercise. And so uh, went right into athletic training in a uh, university of South Florida and Tampa, and then went right into PT school after that. So I'm a, a PT and athletic trainer. And then one of my rotations as an athletic trainer was with John Hisamoto in Tampa. And, um, so John was, you know, when he came out of college back in the early eighties, um, he was at, in Baltimore and at the hospital, they had an old Cybex. And uh, this is back when they only did concentric, concentric uh, testing, essentially. And uh, the story he tells is that he was working with a tennis player and uh, they rehabbed him and they sent him through a test and everything came back normal. But he kept telling John, um, you know, every time I lunge forward, I, I'm, I, my knee gives out and I have pain. So then John realized, well, that's because that's happening in the eccentric mode of contraction. And it was right around then that Chattanooga came out with the Kincom uh, with this ability to do eccentrics. So John had uh, his athlete tested at a local hospital or a local clinic. And turns out this guy had a huge eccentric deficit when you, tra- when you tested for that. So John went back to his hospital and he said, hey, we need to get Kincom because it can you know, pick up eccentrics. So they got the, they got the machine and the, the guy who installed it said, hey, I built your machine. I'll be back in two weeks to teach you how to use it. Well, John, he wasn't going to wait for that. So in the course of those two weeks, he dove into it. And then when the guy came back to uh, train the staff, John was teaching him things. So he got started with Chattanooga. Um, They invited him up there to show him what he was been working on. And then that's how he got started on the national scene and international. So he started doing a lot of lectures. He kind of created some education content around uh, isokinetics and eccentrics. Well, uh, fast forward to the mid nineties, um, when isokinetics kind of fell out of favor and everybody stopped using them, John kept going with it and he kept developing these different, uh, protocols. Um, and then he started doing a lot of, um, he was doing, you know, education. He'd bring clinicians from usually, uh, Asia and Europe to his clinic. 
And it's not like he could just throw up videos on Instagram like I do, showing off some of the new features. Um, so, he, you know, he'd have to write this stuff up if he was going to, you know, spread everything he was learning. Well, he was also, you know, running a clinic. He had a family. He was working with USA Rugby. So he didn't exactly have time to kind of what I say, you know, spread his methodology out. So when I came on um, as an athletic training student, we had already had, you know, a little section on isokinetics. And so watching what John and uh, his other clinician, Dwayne, were doing in the clinics, and I was like, this is completely different than what we're learning in school. So I I really kind of latched onto it. Well, they had just linked up with CSMI uh, a couple years before that. And uh, CSMI, Rob and Rich, they had um, acquired the company from Cybex. And they approached John and said, hey, can you help, you know, modernize what we're doing, bring the clinical side to it? Um, So that's kind of right when I came around. Um, And so as a student, I'm watching them. And then I actually worked for him for three years while I was in PT school. And my main job, essentially, other than, you know, cleaning tables and folding towels, was I was setting up the machines, whether it's the Kincom or the the Norm. And they'd say, hey, we need a left ankle on the Norm. We need a right knee set up on the the Kincom. So three years, I'm just, you know, doing these two or three times a week, uh, just, you know, running setups. And um, then in spare time, we'd kind of practice. Um, you know, it's like, hey, there's this, you know, isometric setting. We know what it can do. Let's see what else it can do with, you know, like the newer technology. So I was with John for four years as a PT. And then my wife, she's in the medical field. And that meant that we had to leave for her fellowship. So when I left, um, I was just starting with John on getting some of the education out there. Um, but then he he retired around this time, and I asked him like, "Hey, can I kind of pick up where you've left off?" And uh, you know, he he's like, "Yeah, absolutely, let's do that." So um, I had a chance to go to the NFL Combine. Uh, CSMI invited me out there. I did that for I think six or seven years. Um, and then each year I'd go, I'd either go a day early or stay a day late. And so I'd always kind of help either build the machines or break down the machines at the end of the week. Uh, so then I got a call. And they said, hey, um, you know the education side. You know how to build the machines. Uh, there's a clinic in Costa Rica that's looking to you know, have a machine built and learn how to use it. Can you do that? So I, you know, I was like, yeah, absolutely, let's do that. So um, that kind of started me on the education path with them. And uh, then I was like, well, we need to really expand this. Let's use the digital age to kind of show some of these new things we're doing. So I made a little ACL course you know, how you can use the machine with ACLs. And then in 2018, we did a little uh, free webinar series that uh, we advertised a little bit, and that's still on their website. And after compiling that, it was like 12 hours of uh, webinars. And I was like, you know what, we might as well take this, polish it up, you know, make it a little bit more um, about, you know, what the data shows, the how how to actually apply it. So I made that into a a CEU course, which uh, we've had out for a couple of years now. I'm actually going through and updating it right now um with you know i didn't have a lot of video on a lot of things that i was doing so i've been able to acquire that video the last few years so i'm kind of going through it and updating it right now but the cool thing was is that um we basically took what isokinetics started out as in the 70s and 80s and that's really all you're going to find if you actually look up the textbooks or how to use these machines and then we took what kind of john brought to it and then we start experimenting with other things like, hey, how can we use isotonic mode that's different than just isotonic? You know, how can we use some of these dynamic feedbacks for isometrics? What are some of the other eccentric, isokinetic things that we can throw in there? So we really approached it from a clinical use. And you know, a lot of the you know, uh, text that you're going to find out there, that's more from like the uh, a research use. Um, so we really found ways of not just you know, doing you know, knee testing, but how can we use this for our, our shoulders? And, you know, how could, can we use this for our lumbar patients? Um, and all the way from day one, you know, post-op, total knee or ACL, all the way through getting them back on the field. There's so many different applications. And so kind of right now, one of my big goals is to, you know, teach all these different things that they can do. There's not too many other uh, interventions that or modalities we do that came out in the 70s and 80s, and we still do it the exact same way. We've, we've kind of advanced a little bit in, in rehab. And so that's that's kind of my thing, is teaching people how to use them. And uh, so right now with CSMI, not only do I kind of run their education, 
but I'll go out and I'll, you know, when people buy a machine, I'll install the machine, uh, spend a few hours with the staff getting that going. But then I also, you know, do a lot of follow-ups, uh, you know, Zoom meetings. Uh, I get a lot of FaceTimes, uh, you know, if they have a question on the spot. So, I, you know, I'm really big on not just, you know, teaching them the basics, but really getting them up and running with the equipment. Yeah. So let's um, let's split today's conversation into two halves. The first maybe on testing and second on interventions. Um, I think with the rise of force plates, frames and essentially tools that are definitely smaller than isokinetic machines, there'll be some practitioners, particularly newer ones, who are used to seeing and used to using objective tools for measuring force, but may not have been exposed or come across isokinetic machines, depending on where they work and what they've got. Um as an intro, or perhaps as a recap for some, can you give us a bit of an overview of the tests that you classically perform on the machine um, and still classically use yourself? Yeah, certainly. And, you know, you mentioned before force plates, you know, there's the functional testing. That's all part of it. Isokinetics is one part of it. And even with the treatments, you know, you're not on the machine for 60 minutes. You know, if you have an hour with the patient, you might be on the machine for 15 to 20 minutes. So it has to fit into a part of your overall treatment uh, plan. Um, so that's, that's one big thing. One myth that uh, I like to dispel is that, you know, it's part of the, the program. Um, with testing, traditional isokinetic testing, essentially what you do, and we'll just talk about the knee today just to keep it simple, but you would essentially have them kick up uh, with their quad and then pull back down with their hamstring. So you're looking at, um, you know, how strong are the muscles in a concentric mode only? Well, we know that that's not really just how our muscles function. When we're talking about rate, that's a little bit different. But when it comes to how our muscles function in functional activity, especially in sport, it's usually from an eccentric aspect. Um, if I'm going to land from a jump or make a change of direction, I have to be able to um, eccentrically control that knee in that sagittal plane. Um, so the traditional testing, if, you know, if nothing else, you at least have some numbers. But if you're only doing concentric only testing, you're really missing a huge part of it. So when it comes to the isokinetic test, the new one that's, well, it's really not new, but it's new kind of out to the world is the concentric eccentric test. So essentially we would have the patient push up on the way up. And then when the dynamometer starts to come back down, they don't pull with their hamstring. They're going to keep pushing up with that quadriceps. So that's going to give you um, that eccentric data, right? Um, and that's important because all the time we would test people out. And if you look at their torque curves and their numbers concentrically, they're almost identical. But then we look at that eccentric side, uh, you see the numbers fall off the, the lines instead of being a nice, smooth, ascending, descending curve gets a little bit wavy and jagged or might even fall off completely. And that's going to indicate to you that when they go to make that change of direction or if they have to land, um, that, that muscle is going to give out and quiver. And then they're going to compensate through the hip um, to accomplish that task. And that's one of the things about if you only do functional testing is that if we're training our athletes how to do agilities and plyometrics, and especially if we're training them for the, the hop testing, um, they're going to find ways to compensate through their weaknesses. And there's tons of research out there that shows that, you know, if you have somebody with a quad strength that's, you know, close to that opposite side, they're going to be able to perform their tasks without any compensations. But if you have somebody who has weakness still in that quadriceps, they're still going to be able to perform their task, but they're going to compensate through the, the hip and the trunk. And then those compensations are what's going to, you know, lead them to further injury. So, you know, when it comes to testing, you gotta, you gotta include, you definitely need to include that functional task, but you, you need to be able to isolate too. So that's the, um, the concentric eccentric test. And we could talk shoulders and stuff all day as well, but we're going to keep it to the knee today. The other one though, is the isometric test. And essentially almost anybody who walks in your clinic, whether, you know, they're the, the athlete or, you know, somebody who had an ACL or if they're my mom with, with knee arthritis, if they can do a manual muscle test, they should be doing a manual muscle test or an isometric test on the machine. So if we're talking ACLs, Typically, you can get your first test on them. You know, you want to test that uninvolved leg right after surgery if possible to find out what their strength is at their baseline before it starts to decline. But if nothing else, if you can get a test on them at 8 to 12 weeks after their ACL surgery, then you can track 
right? And uh, I mentioned the quad earlier. I forgot to mention, you know, we're also testing the hamstrings too, right? So we can track what their quad is, you know, at month uh, two, uh, what their hamstring is at month two. And then we can track it at month three, at month four, at month five. So we're identifying uh, where their where their strength is coming from. And I've seen it before that, you know, between month three and month four, they're progressing in the clinic. But when we do the uh, the isometric testing, it's that all their strength is coming from their hamstrings. So they're just overutilizing that posterior chain. So it gives you a chance to say, hey, we really need to make sure that we're, you know, targeting this quadricep or um, we're not over treating the knee and causing them to have pain and swelling, which is inhibiting their quad. Um, conversely, if we're seeing that they're making good gains, you know, they're gaining 15 to 20 percent strength month to month in that quadricep of the hamstring is kind of not, you know, moving along and lets us know, hey, we really need to spend some time on that posterior chain. So we'll really start hitting that the RDLs, the hip thrusters, you know, things that's going to bias that posterior aspect. Um, it gives us a chance to look at what that other leg is doing. We know that the, the uninvolved leg is going to lose strength uh, after surgery. So especially if you can get a test right after surgery, or if they ever come in for a uh, prehab, you can test them then. But you can track what that strength is. And if you're noticing, hey, you started out at 100% of your body weight with your quad. Now you're only at 70% with your quad. Let's make sure we're spending some time on that, that other limb as well. That way we can you know, reduce how much uh, strength you're losing in that side. So the, the key is to do serial testing. So you're testing them early in the rehab. You're testing them in the middle phases. So by the time they get to five months, and then when we start doing that concentric eccentric testing, uh, isokinetically, you already have an idea of where they're standing. And, you know, we, we've got to make sure we're not just comparing them to that opposite limb, but we're getting body weight metrics the whole time. So we're seeing how close they are to those minimum return to sport uh, norms that we have early in the process. So when it comes to month five, you do that first concentric eccentric test. And then in month six, you see where they are. And then you can, you can plan from there. You can see, hey, you're seven months out. You're at minimum strength, right? You're good as far as that. But then we can start talking, okay, let's test you in a fatigue state. Let's wear that quad and hamstring out and test you while you're fatigued. So we can see, hey, you're good to, you're good to go at the start of practice or a game. But when you're fatigued, your, your strength is down 20%. So we got to make sure we start pulling you out when you're getting fatigued. And so then we can test you a month later, see where that, you know, I call it the fresh strength is. Uh, you, you're even stronger. You've met, you're not just at that minimum strength, but you're beyond it. And now when you're in that fatigue state, you're, you're meeting those minimum numbers. So it just gives you a chance to see what you're treating. Um, so that, that, that's big. Um, another big thing that's been in rehab lately is looking at rate. Now, rate of force development is typically tested isometrically. Um, we, we quick, we look and see how quickly can that muscle fire. So, you know, what's that, what's your torque at, at two to 300 milliseconds? Um, so you can certainly do that on the machines, but there's other ways of doing it too. So when we do that, uh, eccentric test or the concentric eccentric isokinetic test, we can look at, um, power development, you know, and you're just kind of comparing it to that, by, uh, that other limb and you can see, Hey, yeah, you're, you're still 15% down. You've met your minimum strength on both legs. But you're, you're not generating that power fast. And it's nice because then you can look at it from an eccentric standpoint. Um, and then you can, when you retest them at month seven or month eight, you can really track, you know, how quickly they're able to generate that. But then there's even a test that I love to do. There's no research out on there. And any of the research that are, researchers that are listening, I would love to talk to you because I think this is a really cool way to test. Um, essentially, I like to take an isometric uh, MVIC. And let's say you hit 20 or 200. Uh, foot pounds. Well, what I do is I set the isotonic load on the machine at 20% of that. So we'd load you up at 40 foot pounds. And then we look and see how quickly you can accelerate that load through the range of motion isotonically. Um, and that, when you do that test, it gives you really cool um, parameters. It tells you what their peak power is, what the average power, um, what their velocity is, how quickly they can hit that peak velocity. But it also gives you really good graphs that you can look at their velocity or their power over the range of motion. And it's almost like uh, if you were to take that, that isometric test, looking at rate, those first you know 200 milliseconds, it's really hard to zoom in on that. But when you do it this way, it really kind of expands it. And so you can see 
any deficits that they have much different or much easier. It just stands right out to you. And it's going to give you, um, you know, not just graphically, you know, visually, but you see it with the numbers when you look at, you know, how many Watts they are generating, how quickly they're hitting that peak torque. And so it, it's, I really like that test. I would love to see some uh, researchers out there looking at that and to see if that has any um, clin- or statistic significance. Cause clinically I've seen it before. Um, I've seen, you know, so many people that I test that their strength is good, but then, you know, we look at that and it is kind of like a big light that pops up. How did you um, decide on that percentage load when you're doing it? Um, that's just, you know, taken from um, when you're doing like a rate of force development testing, um, 20 to 30% or up to, you know, I've seen 40% is a good amount to go with. Um, but I, I just went on the lighter end of it because um, you, you want to be able to see how quickly they can generate the power. And if you go too heavy, um, they're not going to be able to generate it quickly. Um, now, when I'm doing treatments, which we'll get to later, I do go higher than that when I'm looking at that, um, that ability to accelerate the load. But when I do testing, I, I just do 20%. One of the things I wondered, and, and this can be true of any type of testing technology, there's a, there's a learning curve if you're the user. So if it's the first time you've ever used an isokinetic machine and you tested the person maybe the next day, the scores might be higher through you know, task familiarity. And that's as true on any technology. How, you know, whether it's in session or over sessions, how much practice do you generally expect someone to need until their first kind of test score, if we call it that, is trustworthy and you you, you, you feel like you can hang your hat on it? No, you're exactly right. Especially when it comes to uh, the eccentric test. So if you have an athlete and they're on your machine a couple times a week and they've been loading eccentrically starting at slow speed since like week six, week eight, and now it's month six, um, they're going to know how to perform it because they've met that learning curve. And it's not just from a true learning curve. It's a neurologic thing, especially when you're getting uh, an inhibition to that muscle, you're retraining that muscle eccentrically. And we do it all the time with step downs and lunges. But when you're isolating that quad, um, you'll, you'll see it, it takes it a while to come back. So, but if it's somebody who's in your clinic and they're used to it, you can pretty much hang your hat on that. But then you get the patients who come in, you know, a one-off. So they might be going to another clinic or let's say I just got the machine and I'm comfortable uh, testing you, but that patient's never been on it before. Um, you really have, if you get a chance to do a familiarization, a familiarization session, to where they can practice it, that's great. But if it's just, hey, we we drove an hour to get this test or um, the one time, you don't just put them on there, give them, you know, five reps as a warm up. You should really put them on there as an exercise first, sub maximally, let them see exactly what it's going to feel like. Because um, everybody's really good at pushing up concentrically, but when that thing starts to come back down at you, um, that, mus- that muscle's going to, uh, if it hasn't been trained, it's going to start to have some inhibition. And you'll see patients who, when you first start out, they're maybe pushing, we'll just say, you know, 200 foot pounds. But by the time you've kind of trained them on it after a few reps, now they're pushing, you know, 250, 275. So one nice thing about uh, the, the norm from CSMI is that we have what's called the interrupted stroke test. So instead of them coming on there and the machine moves up and then it moves right back down three times and they're, they're pushing or pulling into it, it gives you a chance to um, decide which reps you want to choose. So you can have up to 10 repetitions. So let's say we do our warm up, and, um, you know, it's like an exercise set sub maximally. And then we actually get into the test. Let's say reps one and two aren't that great, but on rep three, you can see, Hey, I'm figuring out how to do this. And it's not that they weren't pushing as hard as they can, but it, you can see that the muscle inhibition is kind of, it's like the brakes are coming off. So you can see that their torque curves are getting smoother. Uh, the torque amounts are getting higher. So, um, what we typically do is I'll say, you know, on your mark, get set, go, they give me a concentric rep. I give them about a 10 second rest. Um, then I say, go, the machine will come down, they'll push up into it. And the machine gives you, the software gives you up to 10 repetitions to pick the three best ones you want. So that's nice. You can throw out any bad reps and say, whether it's just a low torque amount or, they stopped pushing before the end of the range of motion, right? Um, so it gives you a chance to get a better, more precise reading of what their t- true strength is. 
all you do is put them on there and here, here's your three reps. I hope they were good. Right. Um, it, you don't, you don't have that. So having the ability to use the interrupted stroke test, that's huge. And that was one of the things John developed with, uh, Kincom was that, you know, they push up and then on the way, um, he had the ability to, um, tell it, yes, let's, let's take that rep. And they, you know, do another rep and he'd say, yeah, I don't like that one. It's below where you were or you, you gave up early. So he could throw that out. So when um, CSMI approached him, uh, he brought that into it. Uh, they had developed the interrupt stroke test. So that, that's a game changer right there. The downside, it does take a little bit longer to perform. Uh, if you're just doing a continuous uh, isokinetic test, you can knock that out within you know, five minutes really fast. But it takes a little bit longer if you're doing that interrupted stroke because you, know, you might have somebody who takes seven or eight reps to get the three ones that you want to record. So that, that is the one downside to it. Um, it's usually just the quadriceps that takes a little longer. Uh, it's the one that, you know, has that inhibition after surgery. So when you, you know, knock out your quad reps and then you move on to the hamstring reps, it's, uh, the hamstring usually goes a lot faster. People are a lot more consistent with the hamstring. Let's say you've got your, you've, you've got your data now, you, the person's acclimatized to using the tool and you've, and you've got your, um, you've got your information. Can you talk us through key interventions that you do using the machine. Obviously people listening will know how to train a quad in the gym, but, um, or you hope, but can you talk us through kind of interventions, quad hamstring, you know, whatever kind of fits your, you know, the narrative that we're going down here, talk us through the interventions and, and maybe like new ways that people can use these machines that they may not have seen. Absolutely. So, and again, we'll just kind of stick to ACL because uh, it gives you a chance to do a lot of the interventions. Uh, really your first two, you know, two to three weeks, four weeks, you have bigger fish to fry, right? You're working on their pain, uh, getting their quad to wake up, their patella mobility. So on the machine, you're just having them on there, kind of like using it as a CPM just to kind of help desensitize that knee, right? So that's your first, you know, three or four weeks. But then when you can start doing isometrics, most people around week four. So we start off with what's called static isometric. So I put you at 60 degrees and you just push into the pad lightly and you just push and hold and you just keep it there. But then when that starts to, you know, you do it one or two times like that. And then we start going multi angle isometric. So we're going to move you all the way through the range of motion starting, you know, 30 degrees, 50 degrees, 70 degrees, 90 degrees, but it's still static. You're saying quadricep fire. That's it. But then we can move you to a new intervention. And I call it dynamic isometrics. So we're using the biofeedback. And what we'll do is we'll have the patient give us, it's not an MVIC, but they're just setting that maximum limit. They'll push into it. And let's say it hits, you know, 25 foot pounds. Then the machine's going to give them targets. And so they'll have a little circle on the screen and they have a target and they got to push into it to match that. Um, and they have to, you know, hold it and maintain it. And then that target's going to move around. Or it'll have a maze, you know, they'll have a maze and they're navigating through the maze as they're pushing into it, generating more or less torque or even games. So we're starting to talk even more reactivity. Some of them, it's a little bit more predictable. You can see the path ahead of you. But when you start talking games, um, the purpose of working those dynamic isometrics, it's not just, hey, quad, generate torque, but control that torque. All right generate that torque to, you know, 70% of the maximum. That's where the target is. And you can do it really slowly. And then your next target is, you know, 25% of your maximum, but you have to go to it quickly and hold it and maintain it. So we start working on really generating torque and controlling it. So you can see that uh, neurologic uh, factors kicking in there. That re-education is really in, uh, increasing. And that's when you really start to notice, hey, when you came on, you know, we can look at your gait or we can give you an exercise or balance, whatever it is. Um, and we can see how you perform. And then when you come off of that intervention, it's like that quad is engaged. It is, it is firing. And now we can move on to some harder interventions. Um, and then the fact that we're doing isometrics, you know, um, isometrics are really good for relieving pain. So whereas you might start out and you're generating 25 foot pounds well, after doing that for a few minutes and you get a rest break, then you come back to it. Now you're giving me 40, 45 foot pounds. And we just kind of keep everything to like, you know, pain limits because we don't want people pushing into pain, you know, post-op that early on. So you really start to see that kicking in. Uh, the next big thing to go to is the isokinetic progression. 
And most people, when they do that standard isokinetics, just like I mentioned with the testing, uh, you know, they'll push up with their quad concentrically and then pull down with their hamstring. And they typically start out, you know, faster speeds. What we do is we start out with an eccentric bias. So we'll start you out at maybe 10 degrees per second. We run the machine not as an isokinetic mode, but actually as a CPM mode. And that allows the machine to lift up the limb for you concentrically. And then you're just generating that torque as it's coming down. And you're not, it's not about how hard you can push. It's about teaching that patient that ideal torque curve, you know, generating more torque as that knee bends. And when that knee starts to get into the deeper ranges, when that quad wants to give out and become inhibited from that stretch uh, aspect, you're training them to be able to push through that. And then over the course of the weeks and months, we're slowly increasing those speeds faster and faster. So we're taking them at 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 degrees per second. Um, So they're generating more torque as they go. Their quads waking up. And then around week 12 for most athletes, this is when we reintroduce the concentric mode. And so the reason, other than just focusing on eccentrics, one of the reasons why we eliminate that concentric mode initially is that concentrics use up to 70% more oxygen. It's much more metabolically demanding. And since we're going really slow speeds eccentrically, that's a long time under tension if you're pushing up on the way up and on the way down. So if we did both modes of contraction, you'd get through maybe three or four reps and then you'd be fatigued. So by eliminating that concentric, it not only allows us to focus eccentrically, but allows us to get more high quality eccentric reps by letting the machine lift it up for them. Well, as they start progressing, we get into... um, we switch then to the true isokinetic mode and now they have to push up on the way up and push up on the way down. And we do everything with the the hamstrings too, right? I'm just talking quad, but we repeat everything for the hamstrings. So now we're going faster. Uh, We're talking 40, 60, 80, a hundred degrees per second, 120 up to about 160 degrees per second over the weeks. They're generating more torque. The muscles getting used to being decelerated faster but we're also working on uh, muscle endurance because we just doubled our time under tension by bringing back the concentric mode. We're, um, it's more metabolically challenging. And at this point, when we're getting them prepped for agilities and running, we want to also work on that muscle endurance as well. Now, at this point, this is when a lot of our high school athletes, you know, they're going to be discharged around month five, month six to the gym program. But if you have any, you know, collegiate any private pay, any professional athletes. This is when we then move to some of the faster speeds. And when we go to faster speeds, we start going, you know, 200, 250, 300, up to 500 degrees per second. But we kind of switch back to the eccentric bias. And uh, so we'll still, you know, they still have to push up on the way up to to re, I I call it reloading. Um, So they start in that extended position. But then we set a a torque threshold. So now that machine's not going to shoot their leg back down until they hit, you know, 25, 30, 35, 50 foot pounds. So they're starting out with that muscle in a, you know, engaged. And that machine is going to shoot them down. And again, the, the slowest speeds we usually go with this is like 200 degrees per second, all the way up to 500 degrees per second. And that limb is coming down really fast. Or if we're talking hamstring, it's really coming up quickly that they're having to generate that torque through. And uh, this is around the time that they're really kind of getting into those plyometrics. They're getting into uh, more dynamic sport specific activities. And the goal here is to be able to um, make the quadriceps or the hamstrings continue to contract under those faster speeds. Um, And if we talk hamstrings, we can start taking that muscle to its end range. We can, you know, crank the hip up and do a high flex position and really start working that hamstring to its full elongated position under fast deceleration loads. So that's the, uh, that's the bulk of what you're going to be doing with the machine is really, you know, on the isokinetic progression. Um, Another thing that we like to use is isotonic mode. And we'll go all the way back to, you know, week four with this. So early on, we're not using it to work on strength. Again, we're, we're, we're taking it back to neuromuscular control and proprioception. So we'll load up the machine with zero uh, foot pounds of torque. So it's just they're lifting up the weight of their foot, uh, their limb, and the adapter. 
But we go back to that dynamic feedback. So we're having them play games, giving them targets, giving them a maze. Um, and then they're, they're controlling it now by positioning their knee. Whereas before with the dynamic isometrics, they were doing it by generating torque. Um, now they're doing it by positioning. And then over the course of, you know, week six, week eight, week 10, we start increasing the loads. Because then, you know, this is also when we start bringing in that muscle endurance as well. So we're using that to complement the isokinetic strengthening. So they'll do, you know, two or three uh, isokinetic protocols, and then we'll finish off with some of the isotonics under a light load. Well, the machines, they're not a cam and pulley system like you have on a knee extension machine. On those, uh, the, its shape is designed to where as you get weaker at the end range of extension, it lightens the load for you. Well, it doesn't do that on these machines. It's a dynamometer. If you set it at 50 foot pounds, it's always 50 foot pounds. So you're going to get to sticking points. So there comes a point where you just can't lift it heavier. But what you can do is you can manipulate the loads and to where the machine starts giving you perturbations. So what we'll do is we'll set, we'll just say 30 foot pounds. As I'm raising this up, it's 30 foot pounds. But the moment I go to an isometric hold and it starts to move down just a fraction it switches it to 30% greater at 39 foot pounds. So essentially it's giving them perturbations and you're doing that with the dynamic feedback. So it's just like what we do with shoulders. You know, the, you're bouncing their arm back and forth and they're trying to control it, but it's not just statically. They're trying to control that as they're um, following along with the games or the mazes. So it really s- continues working on neuromuscular control and endurance, you know, long after those initial phases. But then as we start getting into about week 16, week 20, when they're getting into agilities and plyometrics, we, uh, we change our iso- isotonics at that point back to um, what I mentioned earlier with the testing with the rate of force development. So we'll find out, you know, what is, and you can do an isometric load. Hey, you hit 200 foot pounds. So we'll start you out at a minimum of 40 uh, foot pounds isotonically. And because you can set the range of motion on the machine, they're able to push through the end. If we just got you on a knee extension machine at the gym and had you extend as fast as you could, the problem is is that you're going to lock your knee out. (laughs) That's not going to feel good. Or you're going to, you know, if you're doing it with a a squat or a deadlift, you're going to, you know, come up off the ground if you're in, if you're doing it truly where you're accelerating as fast as you can, Uh, or you'll hit, you know, a metal plate on a metal plate, right? So because we can set the range of motion stops and it's kind of cushioned at the end, I, I liken it to my, my six-year-old. She, she's in karate and she's learning to punch and she's learning, hey, you don't just punch the bag, you punch through the bag. So that's what we train people to do. It's like, hey, I want you to take this, you know, the knee extension and you're going to shoot it up and explode as fast as you can all the way through the end of that range of motion. Then you bring it down, take a nice deep breath and load it up again. And um, you can adjust on the Humax software, you can adjust the load as you're doing it. So let's say we we started out at 40 foot pounds. You accelerate really fast. Now I'm going to take you to 45. You hit that one hard, take you to 50, right? I'm going to titrate it up to the point where I'm looking at my feedback and it's giving me uh, a reading of your power and it's in like a bar graph. And I'm noticing, hey, when we got to 55, you were still rocking with your power. We go to 60, your lines are dropping. And I can visually see that you're not going as fast too. So I can then click it back down. And the other thing about power is it's very fatigue uh, mediated or modulated. So as you fatigue, I can just click the mouse right there and see, all right, now, hey, we're back to 45 pounds. Give me three reps there. You start to slow down or your power is reducing. Let's take you down to 40. So we, we can work on rate of force development in a safe way where we're isolating those different muscles. Um, And same thing goes for any of our our throwers. Uh, Everything I'm talking about with the knee, we can do the same things for uh, the shoulder with any of our baseball players or upper extremity patients too. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So... Uh, what we'll do is when you set the loads on the machine, if you're doing isometric, you're setting it to an angle. If you're setting uh, your isokinetically, you're telling it what speed to go at. But when you tell it to go to isotonic mode, you're telling it the uh, amount of load to go to. And if I'm just on a knee, you know, knee extension machine at the gym, I you know pull the pin and I put it at 20 foot pounds. Well, it's going to be 20 foot pounds on the way up and or 20 pounds on the way up and 20 on the way down. But on the machine, we have the ability 
to set the concentric and the eccentric loads differently from each other. So if I'm setting you at 20 foot pounds on the way up, I'm going to put you up to 30% greater on the way down. So as I'm going through, um, whether it's, you know, the roadway, um, response time, interactive path or line, breakout, pong, um, any of the dynamic feedbacks we have, uh, you're going to get a target. And as you're moving up, it's staying that 20 foot pounds. But the moment it starts to come down, or it's really when you hit an isometric hold, um, it's really hard to keep exactly in the same position. And it's very, it's really sensitive. And it notices that you're, you're starting to come down out of that position. It switches it over to 26. So it feels like somebody's pushing down on it, but you're trying to hold it steady because on the feedback, you're going through the little maze. you you have to hold it steady on the isometric line. So it's just, it feels just like perturbations. And then, you know, the, your next target or the maze or the game, you start moving it back down. Well, it's going to stay consistent at that 26 foot pounds that we set. But then when you start to, you know, either get to change a direction, come back up or another isometric hold, it's going to give you perturbations again. And you can either go with some of the presets that we have, but you can even write your own, you know, little mazes or your own targets. So you can create any kind of protocols that you want on there. And uh, what's really cool about not just this, but all of these is that, you know, as you go from day one post-op, just running it on a CPM all the way through the different uh, exercise interventions, the the tests, the patients are always like, wow, there's more to do on this. And they, they really buy into it. Um, so it's not like, oh, all right, let's go on the, let's go on the shuttle and do some jumps. It's different. Almost every, every week you're in there, you're doing something different. Um, and so the, the buy-in and the, the interest that your, your patients have is huge. And you expect it, you know, from your, your kids and your athletes, but I'm telling you, you put some of your, uh, your older patients on there. And you put them on, you know, breakout or any of the mazes or uh, even just some of the isokinetic or isotonic stuff. And <laughs> they, they really get into it. They, they really enjoy it. They, their buy-in is huge. The patient motivation is high. And getting that instant feedback um, as you're doing it, that, you know, knowledge of results as you're performing, that really is a game changer. Yeah, anybody can go sit on the machine and do some hamstring curls. Um, but actually seeing your torque lines as you're doing it. And seeing that, hey, on reps one, two, and three, my lines were here. I'm starting to fatigue. My lines on the screen aren't as high. So I'm going to try to, you know, be consistent and match that line before. Um, that, that's really big. I feel like as well, you know, you put an athlete on it very early on to restore motion. And they get very comfortable and familiar with the idea that they're getting strapped into a chair at the end of the day. And then later on, you know classically you're going to do your strength assessments and your rate of force development assessments by that point as well they're just so at peace with sitting on one of those machines strapped in it's no longer like the apprehension or arousal of like i'm going to get tested today i need to perform it's i've used this a lot of times for a lot of different reasons it's just that comfort level that they probably have with it absolutely and you mentioned apprehension that's a big one you know you just had a surgery you don't know you know it's your first day of uh, rehab, you don't know this clinician, you don't know this machine, and we're saying, hey, we're going to put you on here, and we're going to, you know, have it move your knee. So you you have to start out slow. You always have people that are, just go along with it, but you're always going to have those people that are are very apprehensive. And so you know, you start people out slow, and you know, just because you started an intervention last week, let's say we progressed you to a faster speed on some of your uh, eccentric loading. Well, let's say, you know, you went to a concert over the weekend and now your knee's irritated, right? Well, we, we can dial it back. Hey, let's go back to what we were doing last week. Let's not over-treat it. Um, so there's so many different things you can do on that one piece of equipment. And we're only talking knees today. I mean, elbows, you know, for your Tommy Johns, you know, your elbows, your shoulders, um, the ankle. The ankle's huge on this machine. But even lumbar patients, you know, we can turn that dynamometer and take the pad off and turn it into a mid-thigh pole. And not just get, you know, okay, it's week two after you, after we started. What is your torque now? And now it's week four. What's your torque now? And now it's week six. How hard can you pull now? But we can actually do any of those interventions from that isometric mid-thigh pull position. So way before you're getting your patients into an actual loaded hip hinge or a deadlift pattern, because it's isometric and you can set how far deep into the motion they are, and then they're setting the torque by how hard they pull, and that's their max torque. 
you're able to load your lumbar patients or even your ACL patients. You want to get them to that deadlift, you know, loaded uh, hinge pattern. You can do it way earlier than you would if you just, you know, gave them a, a hex bar and had them do deadlifts. So, and then, but everything you're doing on it's leading to something else, right? So you would do that to get them to where they can deadlift. You're doing your slow isokinetics, you know, the slow eccentrics to get to the faster ones because that's going to carry over to plyometrics. You're doing the, the rate of torque development to get them back to accelerating out of when they make that change of direction. So everything, you know, is going to be related back to the function of the, the athlete. Daniel, you've, um, you've been incredibly generous with your time and also um, sharing an absolute wealth of knowledge using these machines. Where can people follow you? You know, what else are you kind of doing at the moment beyond um, testing and training people on these machines? Um, so I actually, I'm in Atlanta and I have my own little uh, company here where I do, it's, it's some rehab, but it's more uh, personal training, strength and conditioning for people who have had injuries. And it's a cool little model. Um, I actually bring gyms to people's homes and keep them there and then train them at their homes. Um, so you'll see a little bit of that. You'll see a lot of my work with CSMI. If you follow me on my Instagram, which is at Daniel Bodkin, PT, DPT, ATC. Uh, so you can find me there. Um, you can go to uh, find CSMI. They're at uh, humacnorm.com. If you go up to the products page up there, you can see our, our CEU course uh, that we have available. But if you go into the resources tab, you'll see the little uh, webinar series we did way back in 2018. Uh, that's a free free uh, uh, resource we have there. We also have, um, we realized that, you know, a lot of the the professors out there, I was also, also adjunct uh, at University of South Florida. And, you know, I realized, hey, I didn't really learn any of the stuff I'm learning. And so why don't we make this a, um, a lecture that, that professors can use if they want to teach, you know, modern isokinetics and not just, you know, the stuff that's in the, the one isokinetic chapter in, in your text. So we have, um, you know, it's a isokinetics 101 for the classroom. So, you know, that's, that's a 90 minute video that either professors can use to, you know, instruct their classrooms, or it's a good introductory for people who don't want to, you know, they're not ready to sit down and take the full eight hour or seven hour CEU course, but they want to say, all right, what's new with isokinetics? I kind of compiled a lot of it into that isokinetics 101 for the classroom to kind of give you a quick glance at all the different ways that you can use it. And that's also on, uh, you know, humacnorm.com under the resources tab. Cool. Well, mate, thank you very much for your time today. And um, yeah, we'll put all the links for where people can find you and CSMI, of course, uh, in the show notes as well. So yeah, thanks for your time, mate. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. 